Good morning. I did deliver um, a workshop yesterday as well, and, and some of you who were there yesterday are here also today. Um, so by the end of the, the session, if you're confused, which is quite likely, uh, look for people who look slightly less confused, because they have heard some of these things for the second time. And so you can approach them and ask questions. So this is crowdsourcing the explanation. So the topic today is cannabis and sense making in the digital world. Uh, my name is Kaimer. I come from uh, from the UK, originally from Estonia, and I work for a company called Mindbridge. The agenda for today, we're going to cover a little bit about transformations, implementations, and various kinds of big bang changes that organizations are seem to be quite keen to go through every few years. Uh, we will discuss digital transformation because this is the one of the hottest buzzwords still with lots of money attached as well. Uh, we're going to discuss briefly why all of these things seem to be so difficult. So why are we struggling with these transformations, implementations and other kinds of big bang changes? We're going to then go to complexity, sense making and decision making. So how to actually overcome some of those challenges. We'll look at the Canadian framework, which might be helpful for this. I will wrap up the presentation uh, with a few words about continual uh, improvement as well. So my name is, yes, my name is Kaimar. I've been working in, in IT for a little bit more than 20 years, different roles, started in IT operations, been through um, software development, project management, and so on. In some ways, was doing Agile and DevOps before we had Agile and DevOps, um, because in, in smaller organizations, kind of the way we worked was very, very DevOpsy. And uh, nowadays it's seen as a very new thing, it's okay. Um, I've been also delivering professional training for quite some time. Um, working with companies like Oracle, um, Skype and Epicor and Microsoft and so on. So before I moved to the UK, uh, I worked with Skype back in Estonia, uh, helping them to improve, improve, improve service management. And uh, there's my Twitter handle here as well. So if you do use Twitter, feel free to uh, tweet questions, comments, photos uh, and criticism, if you wish to, uh, at this handle. So moving on to change. So it, I would say that change is constant. And in organizations, small or large, we're dealing with all kinds of change initiatives. And um, the opportunities that, that are explained or sometimes seen with changes, from the business side of view, of course, you have the increased business value. When we look at the technical aspects, we could say that change programs help us to tackle technical debt, uh, which is kind of getting worse and worse in organizations sometimes. And then overall, we can say that change initiatives, they, they also enable innovation or potentially uh, enable innovation. But we have some challenging, challenges with this. For instance, when a change initiatives is, it, initiative is kicked off in the organization, uh, very often the, the why is not really that clear. And very often the why is along the lines of, well, but everyone else is doing it, it as well. Um, you have probably seen this nowadays with Agile and DevOps. So why do you want to start using Agile? Well, everybody else is. Why are you interested in DevOps? Well, everybody else is doing DevOps. Why should we invest in digital transformation? Well, all the competitors are investing in this, so we should do this as well. And I think the, maybe the latest, biggest buzzword there would be AI, right? So why should we do something with AI? We don't really know, but everybody else is doing this as well. So we should also at least pretend that we're doing something. There was um, some research published recently about companies who are claiming to be doing something with AI. And I think it was around 60% of those companies who claim to be using AI have no signs of AI. But it's easy to sell. So we have some opportunities with changes, but it's, it's not really that easy. So the holy grail of, of change initiatives in the organizations right now is digital transformation. So the simplest way to how to put digital transformation is to figure out how to leverage technology to help the organization succeed. It is quite vague. It doesn't really say much, which also means that whoever wants to buy this um, will be buying something they don't understand. And whoever sells um, services around digital transformation very often sells whatever they want to sell because, well, the customer doesn't know either, right? But there are some components for, for initiatives around digital transformation, which seem to be quite common around the world. So things that organizations do pay attention to, and things that seem to be helping them uh, to become better. 
so for instance, organizations who are adopting a service mindset, so they're treating their customers through, or they're looking at the customers and customer base through services rather than just products. So service lifecycle is slightly longer than the product lifecycle. Um, they focus on customer objectives to co-create customer value. So the change there is not looking at only your own organization, but also trying to work very closely with your customer to understand what is valuable for them. So you, you look at the, the service offerings, the products for the eyes of the customer, and you're trying to help them to achieve their objectives. It doesn't sound very, very revolutionary, but at the same time, many organizations in the past have completely failed to do this. Also, um, you should be able to increase resilience to be able to learn from experimentation. So there are many situations where we don't know what the answer is and we need to experiment. But if the organization has no resilience, every experiment can be very, very dangerous. So how can we increase resilience in organizations? Also, there is, there's some things that leaders need to do. So the role of leaders is, is slowly shifting from being the, the order giver. I will tell you what to do and how to do this to someone who is a leader and enabler. So I will help you to achieve your goals. Again, it's a, it's a shift which is not really revolutionary, but not that common in organizations either. Uh, you should be able to challenge the status quo in the organizations, and it comes to things like processes and procedures, ways of working. So why are we still doing this? Is it still useful? Should we review this or not? It doesn't mean that processes, for instance, are bad. Um, there are some people in the Azure community who believe that processes are evil and should, we should get rid of uh, processes. This is not correct. Uh, processes are just sequence of steps to achieve something. But you might have processes and procedures in place which are slow and not really fit for purpose anymore. So you should be reviewing them. But organizations very often fail to do that. And perhaps most importantly, for the, for the digital transformation, you need to be able to apply methods and tools that are most suitable for the given context. And the question there is, how do you understand what the context is? So some of the challenges that come with all kinds of change initiatives, first one can be described by the Hawthorne effect. So the Hawthorne effect is based on some research that was done in the US in the 1920s, where they try to study the effects of the change of lighting in the room on people's productivity. So in a production plant, uh, what will happen with people's productivity when you increase the lighting? So they ran the experiment with increased lighting, they measured productivity before that and after that, and they found out that if you increase lighting in the room, productivity goes up, which is kind of okay, kind of makes sense. Then they ran a second experiment where they decreased the lighting in the room and they measured um, people's productivity before the change and after the change. So what do you think what happened? So if they decreased the lighting at the end, uh, did the productivity go down or stay the same or went up? Went up. So it seems that the, the content of the change was not that important. The more important thing was that something was changed and people felt that they were being observed. So people were, re were reacting to being observed. They were reacting to change, not to the content of change. So when we look at organizations nowadays, um, you can go to events and, and listen to success stories. People tell you about, well, uh, six months ago, we did this wonderful thing and everybody's so happy today and we're doing so well and you should do, all do the same thing. It is very likely that um, people in that situation are still reacting to the change itself, not the content of the change. So in six months time, in 12 months time, the situation might be quite different. Right, so you need to figure out whether the effects that you see are a manifestation of the Hawthorne effect or it's actually the result of the content of the change. The other challenge that we have very often, especially when it comes to, to um, kind of management consulting as well, is the confusion between correlation and causation. So with causation, we can say that because of A, B happened. Um, in correlation, A happened and B happened there might or might not be a causal link between them, but we do not know. There's a huge difference between these two things. But very often, again, when we analyze the, the impact of changes that we have done, we confuse what we see, which would be correlation, with causation. So we claim that because we did this, then these and these and these things happened. 
In reality, that might actually not be the case. So we have an example for this as well. Um, it's an example of correlation, but of course, it's, it could also be used as an example for causation if you want to do so. So there are two data points. There is the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool and the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. So these two data points um, have very high correlation. And depending on how you tr kind of how you think of Nicolas Cage as an actor, you might also claim that there's some causation involved. Right. But the overall, it's, a, it's an example of some things that are completely unrelated. But if you analyze them, you could claim that there is some causality involved here as well. There's lots of this happening in the in the management consultancy world. Okay, so as I said before, it is quite important to understand the context. So how do you understand the context? First of all, you need to understand that there are different kinds of systems. So there are three main types of systems. We are dealing either with an ordered system, chaotic system or a complex system. So ordered systems are predictable. Chaotic systems are completely unpredictable. And the complex systems are the interesting ones that we're dealing with on a daily basis. So with complex systems, in, in a complex system, it's, it's more than a sum of its parts. So in a complex system, it's, it's, um, it consists of interconnected parts. The parts influence the system, the system influence the parts, and the parts or the agents influence, influence each other as, as well. So if you think about um, like a normal standard organization, that would be an example of a complex system. Right, so you have employees, you have managers, you have customers, you have vendors, you have processes, you have tools, and all of these things interact somehow. Um, there are some patterns, but none of those, not all of the patterns that you have recognized work all the time. So for instance, the characteristics or how to recognize something which is a complex system. The patterns repeat by accident, so it doesn't mean that there are no patterns, but you can't guarantee that the patterns will repeat. The system itself is dispositional rather than causal. What it means, it's the system is more likely to behave in a certain way, or the agent in the system is more likely to behave in a certain way, but there's no guarantee that they will behave in that way. The system um, puts some light constraints on the agent, so it's not possible to do whatever uh, the agents need or want. The agents themselves modify the system as well. Coherency appears in retrospect, rather than in, ad in advance. So what does this mean? Coherency in terms of, does it make sense? So when you analyze complex systems, when you look at what happened before, very often it all seems to make complete sense. But that does not mean that you can predict the future. Take any major event in history, for instance. When we look at how it's described in the history books, it all makes sense. Event A happened, then event B happened, then C, D, E, and then we got the result. But when event A happened, nobody could predict exactly what's going to happen next. Will it be B or C next? We will have a war or not have a war? So in retrospect, it's quite easy. In advance, uh, it's, it's not possible. In complex system, you also need to understand that all the actions have unintended conse consequences. So when something is done, Probably something that you wanted might happen, but also always something else will happen as well. Something you did not intend to happen because there are too many agents and you, you do not know how the agents uh, interact. Also in complex systems, um, engineering of the future state is not possible. But we as humans, we like trying to engineer the future state for our systems. I will come back to that later on. So if we're dealing, for instance, with complex systems, or, or the question perhaps is, are we always dealing with complex systems or are we dealing with other kinds of systems as well? Because we had um, the chaotic and, and um, ordered as well. So there's a framework uh, called Kenevin. So Kenevin is a Welsh word that means habitat or, or sense of belonging. Um, so there's a Kenevin framework that could be used as a useful tool to, to view the world with and figure out what is the context that you're operating in right now. Um, Kenevin splits the world into five different domains. 
uh, one of the domains is the obvious domain. So each domain comes with its specific type of practices, its specific type of constraints, um, and things that you should or could do there. So for instance, in the obvious domain, you make use of best practice and you make use of procedures. So this is um, a domain where there is one right answer. So when you're dealing with a situation or a challenge and there is only one answer and everybody kind of agrees what it is, you're probably dealing with, with something that belongs to the obvious domain. Uh, the constraints there are fixed, so there's, there are very strict limits on what can be done. Uh, for causal relationships, there are perceivable and predictable, so you can predict if I do this, then that will happen, or if I want that to happen, I need to do this. So usually here, you would respond with a known solution. And procedures, as I said before, procedures are absolutely fine. This is something where m many people feel very, very comfortable. They know exactly what needs to be done. And very often what people tend to do is they're trying to treat other types of systems as if they were obvious. So trying to um, use um, procedures, for instance, or set very strict constraints around what can happen. The second domain is complicated domain. So this is where you make use of good practice. This is where you make use of expert judgment. And potentially there is more than one right answer to, to choose from. So not everybody agrees. You can have different um, teams of experts thinking about this, talking about this and coming up with potential solutions. So this is where experts usually function or the, the, this is where the expert knowledge is needed. The constraints are governing, so there's quite strict limits still on, on what can be done, but there's some flexibility. And also causal relationship, they are knowable, but not necessarily obvious. So if you want that to happen, you don't necessarily know exactly what you need to be doing, but it is possible to figure that out using expert knowledge. So this is where you respond with a chosen solution or a plan to implement the so chosen solution. Now the uh, third one is complex. So something we, we discussed before. So complex in complex systems, there are there is no right answer, right? So you could have various options for answers and none of them is more correct or less correct uh, than any other. This is where the solutions or the potential solutions need to be coherent. I will come back to that when we cover the probes. So in complex domain, you make uh, use of experimentation. So you can't follow a procedure. You can't create a plan because you don't know the causal links. So the only thing that you can do is you experiment or probe. And cause and effect relationships, you can't know them beforehand, but when you look at look back at what happened before, um, they become apparent. Um, in this domain, when you're dealing with that kind of a challenge, you're trying to respond with some kind of actions to move more of the system to the complicated domain. So something that can be planned for. And the fourth one, or the fourth main one, is a chaotic domain. Uh, this is the, the domain for novel practice. The focus there should be acting as, as quickly as possible. So in, when you're in a chaotic situation, you don't have time to sit down with a bunch of experts to start discussing what could be the right solution. You just need to act quickly and then figure out what to do next. So in, in chaotic systems, there are no effective constraints. Anything could happen, right? Okay. This is the image of the Gnemian framework. The four domains I mentioned before, the fifth domain is the domain of disorder that is in the middle there. And the domain is disorder is where you don't know which domain you're dealing with, right? So very often when we enter um, situations, when we start observing the systems or, or start dealing with challenges, we don't know which, which kind of system we're dealing with or into which domain it belongs right now. So we are in the, uh, in the domain of disorder and our task is to figure out which one uh, it most likely is. So as I said, there's a constraints, it's in the obvious, complicated, complex and chaotic. Uh, different types of practice. Um, so best practice belongs to obvious, so always do this. Good practice is sometimes do this, sometimes do that, depends on the context. Exceptive practice is where something is kind of repurposed for a new purpose. So for instance, um, the, the example from biology and, and history would be the feathers of the dinosaurs. So when dinosaurs developed feathers, what do you think the purpose for the, for the feathers was? 
So why did dinosaurs get feathers at one point? To be warm. That was the initial reason for feathers to, to evolve over time. Um, the um, ability to fly as a, is an example of acceptation. So something that was developed or something that had that developed for one reason was now used for something else. How it happened exactly, I have no idea. Like, did I have like a team meeting to discuss how to use feathers and then decided to try to fly? I don't know. But it's an example of exceptive practice. And in normal, like in, in chaotic systems, the novel practice is something that has never, never before been done. Like it's completely new. It's like we, we are dealing with a situation where we don't know what should be done. We need to act quickly because otherwise the chaos will go even worse. So um, let's try this, right? Nobody has done this before. We don't know if it's going to work, but let's try because we need to do something. So one answer in obvious, multiple answers, potential answers in complicated, uh, multiple conflicting uh, hypotheses in complex, and um, mostly action or immediate action required in, um, in chaotic. Now, one of the ways how to kind of understand the difference between complicated and complex is to think about two examples. The first example would be uh, a plane, the plane that flies, right? So with planes, it consists of many different parts and potentially you could take it apart and then put it back together and the plane still works, right? If you know what you're doing, I mean. Uh, an example of a complex system would be a bunny rabbit. Rabbit, yes? So if you take a bunny rabbit and make it into small pieces and then try to put it back together, it doesn't work anymore. Right. So with a rabbit, the, to the rabbit, there is more than the sum of its parts. So if you're into cooking, then of course you can use the pieces of rabbit to make a stew. But it's, it's, it's not possible to make those pieces into a living rabbit anymore. Right. So mechanical systems tend to be complicated. Um, living organisms are complex, but it doesn't mean that every component of every system is exactly the same. So you can have complex systems, for instance, as an organization. So the whole organization is a complex system, but you still might have procedures and processes in place to, so, to do certain tasks. So it depends on what level of, of the challenge that you, you're using to approach this. Also, what is quite important is things don't really stand still in this world. So for instance, you have different kinds of dynamics. So you have the dynamics between complex and complicated. So when you're dealing with complex systems, the ambiguity is quite high. So you don't know what m might work, what might, uh, might not work. So the dynamics is trying to move components of that system into complicated. So you're putting, like, you're um, running some probes, you're discovering there's some, there are some patterns. It's like, okay, so maybe I now understand how this part of the system works. You strengthen the constraints around your experiments to see if it still works. And then if it does work, you have kind of figured out, okay, so this component of the system works this way. The system itself remains complex, but there's an aspect of that system that is now complicated. It's predictable. You can plan for this. You can exploit this uh, as well. Uh, another option is to move things from complicated to obvious. So when you're using experts to come up with solutions, sometimes it might be quite um, expensive to keep using experts to provide very simple solutions. Think about using um, your highest paid uh, developer or your highest paid sysadmin to provide phone support. Right? So in addition to the, to the users not being very happy with that, most likely, it is not a very efficient use of people's time. So what you can do is you can start creating runbooks and procedures that then could be used by other people. Right? So you're moving things from complicated to, to obvious. Um, it can be quite expensive as well. So moving things from complex to complicated to obvious can be quite expensive because you need to run lots of tests and make sure it actually does work as well. 
once you have moved things, moved things into obvious, the risk that you have is that you become complacent. Complacent as in, so this is the procedure that we always follow. So when we see something like this, we know exactly what we need to do next. So this happens, we do this. This happens, we do this. What often happens in that case is you get complacent and you don't really recognize the minor differences in the situation. So when that happens, you had the dynamic of moving from obvious to chaotic. So this is kind of called in Kenevin kind of uh, falling off the cliff. So there's a risk of becoming too complacent and then a falling off the cliff. This has happened with large organizations uh, when they haven't noticed what's happening on the market. So they have had new competition coming up on the market. They paid no attention or they thought, well, we have seen these guys before. They never achieved anything, so we shouldn't really pay attention. We, we still keep doing um, things the way we did before. It should be fine. And then suddenly the competitor takes over the market. And the old company falls over the cliff from obvious um, to chaotic. For the uh, context of IT and Agile, this one here, this is where Scrum lives. So Scrum is a technique for the liminal domain between complex and complicated. So in, in the complex domain, there is very, very high level of ambiguity. It is, a, it is not possible to predict what's going to happen next, but there's, a, there's a, like a small area between complex and complicated where you have a pretty clear idea what might work. So you, you use iterative approaches to actually carry things over from complex to complicated. So there's a place for, um, for Scrum here as well. So some examples, and these examples I would say are probably mostly wrong than correct, but they might still be useful. So a way how to use the Kenevin framework in your daily work as well. So for instance, when we look at IT, IT support, IT operations and incident management there. So things that require first level support can use playbooks and also can use automated incident resolution belong to the obvious domain. Um, all the challenges or the incidents that require a second or third level support, so subject matter experts, um, and have a short to medium resolution time, these probably belong to the complicated domain. Um, incidents that uh, are complex uh, require brainstorming, trialing and swarming. So nobody knows what the solution could be. So let's gather people around, have a discussion and then try some things to see if they work or not. And the example for chaotic, for instance, could be a major incident resolution. So there's a major incident, everything is down, customers are yelling, so what do you do now? You don't know what happened, you need to take action immediately, right? It doesn't mean that you have time to choose the best way or the correct answer, the correct solution, you just don't know what that might be, but you need to do something. Very often that something is you need to communicate, right? An example uh, for how it could be used potentially for project management. So routine projects, uh, something that you have done before, you know exactly how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost, could belong to the obvious domain. Uh, projects that, are, uh, that have knowable risks, but they do require some expertise, there's some flexibility, you're not 100% sure how long it's going to take or how, how much it's going to cost. Uh, you need to use some tolerances around these. Uh, you discover some things as you work based on expert information. So these belong to the complicated domain. So an ERP solution implementation could be that because ERP solution implementation depends on the actual customer. So there's lots of customization that needs to be done. Uh, projects that have a very high level of uncertainty and something that requires experiments could belong to the complex domain. But be aware that sometimes things that are called projects and have a very high level of uncertainty are probably not actually projects. It's probably more in the product management domain, which is usually much more open to experimentation compared to project management. So there's a difference between projects and, and, and products. And then I could say that, well, projects that are in crisis or with unknown scope and business, business rationale could belong to the chaotic domain. And those of you who work in, in the project management might actually feel that most of the projects that they're working on kind of seem to belong to the chaotic domain because nobody needs, nobody seems to know why we're doing this, which is quite common in large organizations. So the, the uber simplified heuristics for this. So how to define the different domains or how to analyze the situation. Um, when someone knows what to do and everybody agrees, that's probably an example of an obvious domain or something in the obvious domain. 
if uh, someone can figure out what to do not everybody needs to agree but you can have options this is probably an example of something that belongs to the complicated domain uh, when no one can figure out uh, and the evidence that you have um, kind of supports conflicting hypotheses so you gather evidence about the situation about the system and then people come with um, proposals for solutions so we should do this and we should do this, or we should do this right so two options and you analyze the uh, the data that you have you analyze the evidence that you have is like I, I like I can't choose like this kind of makes sense and this kind of makes sense but there's no guarantee that it would actually work so what you need to do there is you need to run a portfolio of probes and I will come back to that and then when there's it's when there's a situation where someone must do something now this is probably an example of the chaotic domain and as I said before things move around these these domains as well the the key point here is it helps you to figure if if you figure out which kind of domain you are in right now you are less likely to use the wrong approaches um, if you are dealing with something which currently belongs to the complex domain for instance you won't be wasting time and money trying to create one plan that would work because there is no such one plan at the same time when you are in the complicated domain if you run experiments there it's very costly and not necessarily required right so if, for something that belongs to the complicated domain you can just use expert knowledge to come up with a solution or a few potential solutions so in in our daily work when we use an approach like this when we're trying to find the context for for the challenges for the systems and we're trying to make sense of the world it helps us to first of all avoid conflict because we know where we are very often we have conflicts in the organization where people you know, they, they both seem to be correct but they can't be correct at the same time right so if you're dealing with that kind of situation you might actually be dealing with a complex system or a complex problem which means that you probably need to run experiments there like they they, they, they could both be correct or neither of them could be correct it helps you to understand the levels of uncertainty so for things that are in complex to ask for a detailed five-year plan for the implementation of something that is in complex just doesn't work right because nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow it helps you to avoid the illusion of causality and predictability um, and we like looking at the world as if everything was causal right so when we when we look back at what happened before when you look back at what happened uh, yesterday or the previous week you're creating in your head something that is called retrospective coherence so everything seems to make sense things went in a certain way because of this and this and this but you try when you're trying to analyze what might happen in the future this model doesn't work anymore because you can't predict the future the coherence that you have in your head is made up we may make up stories to make sense of the world um, very important for the project manager is to avoid, avoid estimations becoming promises so we can hope we can of course have estimates when we do project management but when we know that we're dealing with something that is complex and everybody agrees that it's complex the estimation that we have given cannot become a promise but what very often happens in product management in project management the moment you estimate something the moment you give a number that is treated as if it's a promise it works for complicated and obvious it does not work for complex it helps to separate between knowable knowable in hindsight and then as I mentioned before it helps you to choose between suitable tools and methods so you wouldn't be using the wrong thing again and again and again and then being very surprised why it doesn't work so for to to operate or to improve things in the uh, the complex domain so very often we find ourselves in the complex domain no one domain is better or worse than any other domain like they're in that sense they're all equal except perhaps for the disorder which is like if I, if you're in disorder you need to find your way out of that to understand what to do next but obvious is not better or worse than complex and so on and then in it very often we, we tend to start treating everything as complex and we spend a lot of time trying to experiment with things whereas if you just went to the next room and asked the person who knows you would you would actually get the answer right so not everything is complex but if you are dealing with a complex environment complex system or complex challenge uh, for improvement 
you should probably put together a portfolio of probes. So portfolio is probe of, of probes is something where you run several probes or experiments in parallel. Um, all the probes should be safe to fail and all the probes should be coherent. So when I say coherent means when, <coughs> when I have a challenge and I ask people to come up with potential solutions that we could try, they can come, they can come with potential solutions that make sense. It doesn't mean that I need to agree with them. I don't need to agree, yes, I also think that this would work. The story or the, the, the probe, we should try this because of that. If the story makes sense, that is enough. It could be one of the, uh, one of the probes that you run as part of the portfolio. Um, they're safe to fail. So if any of them deliver something unexpected, your company will, go bankrupt, will not go bankrupt and hopefully people will not die. You need to figure out what could be the amplifying or dampening actions. So if you run a probe, and it seems to deliver something that you like or towards what you wanted to get, then what could you do to get more of this? So that's the amplifying action. And in case it's delivering something that you dislike, then what could be the dampening action to have less of that effect? In the portfolio, you should have some conflicting um, probes as well, meaning that if this one delivers what you expect it to, to deliver, this one should fail. Because if you have only probes that everybody believes would um, succeed at the same time, for instance, then very often what happens is they kind of you, you make them succeed anyway, um, and you're not really learning that much about how the system works. Um, there should be some probes that are oblique, so oblique as in influence kind of around the corner. So when you try to change something, you're not trying to address that directly, but you're trying to change or address something around that thing that might then on its own influence the thing that you wanted to influence rather than rather than doing this directly. And it should include at least one naive probe as well. So naive is in that sense, something that is kind of created by a non-expert. So you can have experts pro proposing um, these probes. And then maybe you ask someone from a very different team away from what you have been doing on a daily basis. Like if you're dealing with that kind of challenge, what would you do? So that might be an example of a naive probe. So something that the experts would never try because for them it might feel silly, for instance. So in, in terms of dealing with uh, the complex systems, so the, the portfolio of probes is the best way how to learn more about the system and start moving parts of the system from complex to, to complicated. So from the highly complex rabbit to more predictable plane. Um, but when it comes to the overall direction, it is there's two there's two approaches. Uh, there is the approach of engineering the future state, and this is what most organizations very often like to do for all kinds of initiatives. So when we want to make something happen, whether it be it implement DevOps or um, run the digital transformation program or anything like this, very often we fall into the trap of trying to engineer the future state is like we would like this ideal picture to happen so let's create all the steps that will lead us to that picture in a complex environment that does not work that approach works for obvious and complicated but not in complex in complex environments you are managing the potential of the present so you're not focusing on what the ideal state is but you're learning more about what the current state is and what is possible to change in the current state. And the, what is possible to change is called the adjacent possible. So let's say that this is the good position there. This is the not so good position we are in right now. Rather than only looking at that, what would be the next position which is slightly better than, than the one we are in right now? What is something that can actually be achieved realistically? Let's move there. And then step by step by step, you move towards your end goals. But you also need to understand that the end goals will be moving around as well. Because what you think you will need in five years time is most definitely not what you will need in five years time. Right. So use that five year plan as as uh, like a guiding star, but focus on the adjacent possible. Um, thank you. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me um, after today, 
um, look me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn. And if you want to read some longer stories, then I write about service management, DevOps, Agile, and some other things on Medium as well. Thank you.